Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to follow up on my colleague. Uh, apparently, Californians think alike today. Uh, in the 20 years that I've sat on the dais and uh, looked at report after report of the FBI failure to comply with FISA and its long history of spying on Americans using this legislation as a back door, uh, we've seen a pattern, which is we're promised there are going to be changes, and those changes have not an ever occurred. As uh, the gentlelady who just spoke, uh, Ms. Lofgren, would tell you, you're coming up for reauthorization. If the reauthorization were today, based on, and correct me if I'm wrong, the 2019 report by uh, the, inter the Inspector General that found 17 significant errors or omissions and 51 wrong or unsupported factual assertions in Carter Page's uh, domestic spying, if you will, using the FISA statute alone. Um, in, in addition to that, we have numerous people, including judges, who say if they'd known the truth rather than the false statements, they never would have granted those warrants. Uh, so now the question is, should we, first of all, do you agree with those findings that at least some of those uh, 68 errors or omissions are accurate, including one of your own that was prosecuted for it? Well, uh, Congressman, first, let me be clear, just in case there's any confusion to anybody watching. Of course, all of these applications were filed before I became FBI director. Uh, no, I, be clear. I, and, and, and to be honest, Director, the reason we're, we're having this conversation, Ms. Lofman and I both, is that it's your watch. And organizations, no matter how great they are, are much like airplane pilots. They're not judged on their safe landings. They're judged on their crashes. And this was clearly a crash, wouldn't you say? Well, what I would say is that the Inspector General's report describes conduct that I consider unacceptable, unrepresentative of who the FBI is, and cannot, cannot happen again, which is why I implemented over 40 corrective measures promptly after the Inspector General's report came out, accepted every single finding in the Inspector General's report, implemented every single recommendation in the Inspector General's report, went above and beyond, installed an entirely new leadership team at the FBI, created this new Office of Internal Auditing that I just mentioned to Congresswoman Lofgren. I can go on and on and on, but let me, let me, significant Let me not let you go on and on just because of short time and ask you, uh, what assurances can you give us today that a current audit would not find current failures? Well, as somebody who's worked deeply with auditing firms for all sorts of organizations, the point of an audit is to find problems. And so I, I can't sit here and tell you that, that no audit would find a problem. That's why we have an auditing problem, is to find the problems and fix them. And that's what we're going to do. Okay. Uh, some time ago, under your predecessor, he came before this Congress and uh, defended a, uh, a, a warrant, an unusual one, one that ordered the company Apple to develop software to allow for a backdoor uh, purportedly to be on one iPhone uh, used in San Bernardino by a, a murderer, a terrorist, but in fact they were asking for software that allowed it to be external. Your predecessor claimed that you did not have the technical capability to decipher it. Shortly after that, uh, a, uh, a, pr a college professor showed that for about $300 you could have done it and yet you paid $1 million to an Israeli firm who did it. Today, can you assure us that you have the tools that you apparently did not have, or would we have to assume that you'd have to ask a professor for a $300 solution or the Israelis for a $1 million solution? Well, as you could imagine, uh, the technology continues to improve both for the bad guys and for the good guys. Um, and so it's not a static situation. But well, even knowing, but knowing to, that, but even knowing today, that even knowing today. that there have been two recent failures uh, in cyber attacks, uh, what assurances can you give this committee that you have the resources and a plan to be on the leading edge of cyber rather than the trailing edge of cyber, which appears to be where we are in a number of areas? Uh, we constantly need more resources to get further and further ahead of the bad guys in this particular space. The technology in terms of encryption, which is sort of the point you're getting at with the Apple example, 
uh, has continued to advance in a way that's actually making it harder and harder for law enforcement, not just the FBI, but all across this country, uh, to get into encrypted devices and certainly encrypted messaging platforms. We saw that, for example, down in Congressman Gates's district in Pensacola with the, Na uh, the Naval Air Station attack there. And we tried to get into Apple's uh, iPhone, the device that the terrorists there use. And by the way, he took the time in the middle of the attack to shoot the phone. Think about the presence of mind that he has to have in the middle of that to do that, to try to prevent us from getting into his phone. Our folks were able, in that instance, to reconstruct the phone. Uh, and because of a, of a fluke in that particular instance, we were able to actually get into the device. But it took months and months and months and hours and hours and hours and hours and lots and lots and lots of taxpayer money to get there. And only then, after not having gotten the cooperation that we really could have used from Apple at the front end, we found out that that particular terrorist had been in communication with Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula right on up till the night before the attack, not known at the time that the attack was disrupted. The, so it's an illustration of what a challenge this is for law enforcement, and it affects terrorist investigations. It affects an issue that I know is near and dear to every member of this committee, child sexual exploitation investigations. Uh, and it's something that I hear about. I've been to talk to law enforcement yeah. in all 50 states, and I hear about it from chiefs and sheriffs mm -hmm. in every state about this issue. So it, it is top of mind. We are bringing technical the, tools, using money that Congress appropriates to us to deal with it. The gentleman, we're moving in a direction where we're going darker and darker, so I appreciate uh, very much your concern. The gentleman's time is well expired. Christopher Ray was uh, fr flat out lying right there, and the, and the fact is uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think I'm you know, a huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is. Because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, I, I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues and ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases, and this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category, and they are treating them uh, like unlike I've ever seen in a case, uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm -hmm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C. There is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. It, he made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. 
But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. And the way that the FBI has systematically, as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison-related. There was no white supremacy, uh, massive uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media. When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. And they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who... Um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in, and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other Capitol she's ever been in is a state Capitol that's open 24-7. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between, you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they want to prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is. It's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.